limiting theorem, except that the rest of the limiting theorem has a long and complicated proof, which I don't give. Okay. But at least the story about how to measure is fun. Is fine, and also the amusing thing is that, yeah, the rectifiability of a limit is very useful here. Uniform rectifiability, it is true in many cases, but uh, I was not able to use it for good, right? Okay, why does this thing, okay. Lower sum and continuity, oh, uh, just, okay. Monotonic density. So for this part, I think I will also try to go a little bit faster than I intended to. So again, uh, we stop a second. Uh, now we can take limit subsets, and uh, we can uh, we can take limits in host of measures. Uh, there is another estimate which is upper semi-continuity of a uh, host of measure, which actually is true for let's say almost minimal sets or minimizing sequences, which has a proof which is similar to this one, and I, but I just forgot about it, okay? Next, uh, I'm trying to look at a, an almost minimal set, a return to the story about proving some regularity property of, of those, and then, uh, as you've been told many times, uh, a very important tool is monotonicity of density or monotonicity of whatever you can write which is monotone, right? Uh, it's important, I mean, if you, uh, if you find a beautiful quantity and it's not zero and it's monotone, uh, you should use it, okay? But of course, there's not so many prop uh, quantities like this and density is just your good luck in this case. And the thing is the same for minimal surfaces and many minimal things. Uh, okay, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So here I decided to give you a statement directly, sorry, uh, directly for almost minimal sets. For, so for minimal sets, the uh, statement is density is non-decreasing, okay? So density is this thing that you've seen before, right? Uh, host of measure of a measure of a set in a ball and then you normalize. Uh, and then uh, the first statement is uh, what I said, the, you fix a point, and I will, it's going to be enough for me to fix a point in the set, and then uh, this way things are easier. Uh, then uh, the, uh, this is a function of R, and it's non-decreasing in this case. And otherwise, it's almost non-decreasing or nearly non-decreasing in the sense that you have this function here, you multiply it by a function which is a little bit increasing, just enough to compensate, okay? Uh, and then you get something which is non-decreasing again, okay? Right? Uh, so the function by itself might be uh, oscillating a little bit, but if you multiply it by this other function, uh, you get something like this. So the point here is that uh, the gauge function, you take it small enough so that the integral converges. So for instance, when r tends to zero, this guy has a limit. So uh, the product of the two, because it's monotone, has a limit and you immediately get that the density itself by dividing has a limit. But those other things, okay, very good, okay? And the condition on the gauge function uh, that is needed for making this work is just a Dini condition, but okay. Right, two words about the proof. Uh, the, and maybe don't even read that too carefully. The main point, okay, so you, you can follow, I mean, depending on whether you like uh, people moving hands better than writing down, uh, than reading uh, things, <coughs> or the other way around. Okay, you have this function, you want to show that it's monotone. Uh, let's imagine everything is smooth enough, so in this case, smooth enough is obtained because the measure of a set inside the ball is an increasing function, so in fact, it has a derivative almost everywhere, and it's, it is more than the integral of its derivative almost everywhere, and that's what you use to justify the rest. So uh, if you want to know that this quantity is monotone, you take its derivative and you find out that it should satisfy some differential inequality, which is, well, I'm sorry, I'll have to do it to uh, look at it here, okay? And the differential inequality, in fact, turns out, so the second thing that I should say is that the derivative of the mass inside is larger than the 
one less dimensional, so let's say suppose you were in dimension two, it's, uh, it's larger than the one dimensional measure of intersection with a sphere. Okay? That's also not so hard. Uh, the best way is to imagine now your set is rectifiable, so imagine the set is a countable union or even a single C1 piece, and you just do the computation of a C1 surface, and you find out that this is what happens. Okay, so sorry, so this is what I said here. Okay, and in fact, when you just compute what you need to know, you need to know that the host of measure inside the ball is less than uh, some uh, ratio times the host of measure of one less dimension of the intersection. And it just turns out that this here is exactly the measure of a cone over this intersection. So in fact, what you have to prove is that the measure of a set is less than the measure, probably I have it up there, is less than the measure uh, of a cone over the intersection with a sphere. That's what you have to do, okay? Uh, the set is supposed to be minimal in this case because I decided to do the proof in the minimal case, which is easier, okay? So uh, the, the proof would be finished if you knew that the cone is a competitor for the set. Maybe it's not true, but I'm saying that uh, the cone is a limit of competitors for that set, and that's enough when you check the things. Okay, and here is the picture to convince you that the cone over this intersection is a limit of competitors. So here I draw what I, so I draw the set. I decided that the competitor is obtained by taking this very thin annulus here and making it a very large thick annulus here concentrating everything near the center. When you look at this, then the, sorry, uh, so this small tiny piece here becomes something like this, and it looks more and more like the cone. There is the rest of the picture inside that essentially goes inside here, but it, you know, at the end it's going to disappear anyway, so don't, don't look at it too carefully. Uh, so this is the radial mapping that corresponds to it, and essentially, you know, once, once you agree with this picture, you know that the cone is a limit of competitors, okay? All right. And then you just, uh, I, I told you about minimal sets. For almost minimal sets, you do a proof, you follow the estimates, and you get uh, what, I, what I said. Okay. Near constant density, let me just say again two words about it. As in many theorems, it's good to know that the, mon uh, that, the, uh, that the function is monotone, but it's also good to know what happens when the monotone function is constant. And what happens here is that the, again, if the density, so you have a minimal set, suppose the density is constant, then there is a proof that the set is a cone. It's not too shocking, again, uh, it, it takes more time than I, I would have expected, but it, it is true. It's essentially, it starts by like, looking at all the inequalities and finding out that the set has to have tangent planes that go through the center, and then it's unpleasant, but it's true, okay? And here is a variant of this obtained by what I just said, plus a small compactness argument, and the compactness arguments are allowed because we have theorems about limits, okay? which says that now if you have a set, and let's say it's almost minimal, but with a gauge function which is extremely small, uh, it has a density which is almost constant between two radii, so the density of a large radius is extremely close to the density of a small radius, okay? Then, uh, the set itself was very close to a cone. Again, constant density and minimal implies cone, and I'm saying by shuffling things around, almost constant density and almost minimal with small enough constants implies as close to a cone as you want. And this is very useful. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I said that I would not use it in the rest of the, okay, but we'll see. Okay, so this, sorry, and this is the almost constant density uh, property. I'll see whether I can leave it. Okay, yeah. Right, blow up limits. We're finally ready to do blow-up limits. So blow-up limits is what you've seen before. You take the set, you look at the point, and you just expand little balls near the, I mean, near the center into large size. And you try to take limits of the sets that you get by expanding. So again, uh, 
a blow up limit is you take a sequence of radii. If it's at the point x, you first put x back to the origin. You uh, dilate the set so that it becomes size one. And then you take any limit of a set uh, and you call that a blow up limit. Okay? Those things exist because, again, uh, we took the notion of convergence sufficiently weak to be sure that we would have blow up limits. Okay? And they are not, in principle, they are not unique. Uh, it's part of a story that you have to ask, given an, is it true that uh, at a point there is a unique blow up limit or not? In principle, we don't know. There might be two or three. Uh, for instance, if a set is a spiral, at the center of a spiral, even if a spiral is beautiful, you could have that the blow up limits are any line with any angle or more complicated things. Okay, right. And the reason why I only mention blow up limits now is that before that we didn't have all the material to say what I'm about to say here. If you take a blow up limit, uh, you have a convergence result about Hostoff measure which says that the density of a blow-up limit is the limit of the densities of what happens in the balls. The densities of what happens in the ball tend exactly to the limit that I was talking about, which is the density at the point, so some number, okay? And uh, the result is that the, uh, measure, the density of a blow-up limit is a constant function of a radius. Therefore, the blow-up limits, at least you know that they are cones, because of what I said before, okay? Right. Uh, the limiting theorem saying that if you take a sequence of almost minimal sets, then the limit has to be an almost minimal set with, uh, the, same, uh, with the same gauge functions. When you take blow-up limits, the gauge functions actually get better and better because of scaling. So the result is that the limit uh, is a minimal set, and not only an almost minimal set. So blow-up limits are minimal sets, and they are cones. Okay? Good. All right. I'm going slowly to a regularity result of Gene Taylor. The reason, so we'll soon come to low dimensions. The reason being that in high dimensions, we don't even know the list of cones. Anyway, the idea now is the following. Uh, <coughs> it's very easy to understand what is a minimal set of dimension one, or at least a minimal cone of dimension one. Minimal set of dimension one, we have an idea of what it is. We talked about that before. Uh, the next step is to look at a minimal cone of dimension two, because when you look at a minimal cone of dimension two, you might take the intersection with a sphere, and it's, you know, you have to draw a picture on the sphere, and it's, uh, it's a set which is not exactly minimal, but it's sort of minimal on the sphere. Uh, so you could try to understand how it happens by your knowledge of one, min of one dimensional minimal or almost minimal sets. Get a description of the intersection with a sphere and continue, okay? So what I, what I started saying here is the beginning of a long program that will never end, uh, which is Minimal sets are complicated, but they have blow-up limits, and at a blow-up limit, the minimal set becomes a minimal cone. A minimal cone should be simpler because you look at the intersection with a sphere, you get something that looks like a minimal set of dimension one less. And by induction, uh, you finish the proof, okay? But the induction will, will close at dimension two. Uh, that's okay. Anyway. For you, you also can forget what I just said and say, okay, we know that blow-up limits are minimal cones. It's interesting to study minimal cones. Let's try to see if we can make a list of minimal cones. And of course, this will happen in low dimensions and afterwards we'll not be able to, okay? So uh, this slide is supposed to list minimal cones and I had minimal cones of dimension one, we talked about this. Uh, I continue never to mention the empty set and then there is only two options, the lines and the sets of type Y, which is three half lines. Mm. Okay, that's the minimal cones of dimension one. Of course, as you guess, minimal uh, cones of dimension two are more interesting. And what happens in dimension three is the following. There is a full list. The full list was finished, I think, by Gene Taylor. Uh, and the list is the following. 
you're not surprised, but planes with cones of type T, uh, Y, you've seen a picture before. Cones of type T coming from a tetrahedron, you've seen a uh, picture twice also. And that's all the list of minimal cones in dimension three. Okay, no, nothing more. And again, there is the uh, story about this before. You could guess the list reasonably easy, and then you have to prove that there is no other one. Uh, all the minimal cones should be obtained by looking at the sphere, drawing curves on the sphere. The curves have to be arcs of geodesics because you make a local uh, study here. Uh, compute even you could even compute the uh, mean curvature or do something, and you find out uh, that it has to be uh, arcs of geodesics. And then you have to glue arcs of geodesics on the sphere. You find out that maybe there is something like 20 possible clients. And then uh, you say that all these clients are not really minimal cones by finding better competitors, one after the other, and you're left with those three here. Okay. Uh, this is, it's easy to prove that it's minimal. This, it's also reasonably easy to prove that it's minimal. And this one, typically there is some arguments uh, involving calibrations, which is integration by parts on the domains bounded by the set against the right uh, vectors. Okay. And finally, I have a reference here for a site where you can see pictures of all the clients that didn't work. And better case. And I'll just give you one or two. So this was the simplest client. Uh, so this could have been a minimal cone. So I don't know if you see two triangles, one on top of the, of the other. Then you draw the line, then you get uh, a prism. And then you take the cone of the edges of a prism, and you get this picture. And this, is, this has the right angles, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's not minimal, because you can do this. You can pinch, and it's better. Okay, some people didn't see the previous picture here, so you take the, you pinch at the center, and then you had multiplicity cities that go up, but you don't count multiplicity cities, so that's good, and you get a simpler, uh, you get a thinner guy. Number two, the edges, I mean the cone over the edges of a cube. This also looks like a reasonable client. So here, I'm, a reasonable client means that you know this. Uh, comes from an arc of Greg circle on the sphere, uh, or if you want its faces, and the three angles here are equal at that point. That's the typical conditions that we need. But it's not minimal because you can, for instance, pinch here. You could also have pinched there or the other way around, but anyway, you do better, okay? And I think that's uh, all. And this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, proof that <laughs> I don't know, either soap films follow the, uh, follow the math or that we didn't make a horrible mistake in the computation. Okay. Gene Feeler's uh, Taylor's theorem. I warn you, don't read the thing in the middle because it doesn't help. Uh, uh, this, I mean, I'm also uh, trying to write down the notes for a thing and I realized that this was not helping. So. Here is the typical statement that we would like to have all the time, uh, but we only have, uh, in this case, and a few other ones. So we have an almost minimal set of dimension, let's say in this case, two in some domain, but it's a local theorem, so uh, it's near a point. You pick, uh, so with a small enough gauge function, I decided to take a power. In fact, you can do much better than that, but don't worry. Pick a point of this set. Uh, then the statement says that near this point, so in other words, there is a small ball near this point where the set, the almost minimal set, is exactly the same as, in fact, it's blow up, the blow up limit at that point, which is a minimal cone. Uh, and when I'm saying almost the same, I mean through a diffeomorphism of space that essentially maps the cone to the set in the small ball. Okay, so in the small ball, the set is just a copy of a cone with C1 plus alpha distortion. Okay, and uh, so again, don't read the middle. And the end 
the main ingredient in the main story here is not so much the deformation itself, it's just the structure in terms of faces. It essentially says the, the set has the same structure in terms of faces as the cone, not so complicated, like for instance three faces that make that meet. Okay, and the angles are the same also because uh, because if you look at blow-up limits at a point of a singular set, uh, the angles you're going to find. So anyway, the set is just composed of the same sort of faces. They all see one and they meet with the right angles. And in fact, I claim this is the best description. The rest is just to impress people, okay, or to use a Reifenberg theorem when you don't need one, okay. I, I mean, I'm guilty of that too, but okay. Right, so this is, uh, again, a claim you cannot do much better. In principle, I have one or two pictures saying that the Gintel theorem is true. Uh, so this is, uh, so again, uh, so bubbles with large bubbles, they are almost minimal. Here you see that this set is composed of uh, points where there is a tangent, uh, which is the smooth part. Then you can see here uh, places where the set uh, as three foils meeting with 120 degree angles. And then you have isolated points like here and the other one up there uh, where you have a singularity of type T. And so in principle, what I should say is you can do as many soap films and bubbles as you want. You will never see something more complicated than that. Okay, and it's always going to be sort of C1 here, so this is probably the same picture, uh, I mean, other picture, same story here. So here you have two T points, one here, one here, sorry, and uh, two more there. There's a bubble in the middle, the rest of the faces here are sort of flat, and okay. And again, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, and I do last comments about the Gintel theorem, and then we'll see, okay, I go down so that I can read. Uh, so again, the list of singularities we know. The, the situation is more complicated than minimal surfaces, but that's the thing we like because we know soap films can have singularities. Uh, there is something a little bit unpleasant, which is that the radius at which the theorem holds, you cannot guess so much in advance. It's not, unfortunately, uh, it, we don't know yet the following thing. Suppose the set looks like a T in a ball of radius one, and it looks really much like a T. Is it a C1 version of a T in half a ball? It's probably true, but we don't know how to prove it. Okay. So there is a small point, and, and in fact, the main question is that if the set is really looking like a T in this ball, is there a point of type T somewhere in the middle or not? And this is what we are not able to prove, okay? for uh, why is it is still true and so on and so forth. So that's the drawback, but otherwise the situation I claim is as beautiful as it can be. Uh, I said C1 plus alpha, but if you are minimal instead of being almost minimal, you can improve on that. And it's easier because you already have some structure with faces. So you, had, you, you have some, some way to start uh, doing uh, PDEs, for instance. Uh, there is an extension, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is what I said here, right? Uh, but I don't want to insist so much on it. Uh, for two-dimensional sets in larger dimensions, what happens is the following. The f part of the theorem is still true, but uh, there are two defects. First, the list of minimal cones in dimension four is not known. We know a few, but we don't know we know them all. That's a little bit of a drawback. And second, for all some of those cones that we don't know, it could be that they don't satisfy a property which I call uh, full length, which is a technical property. And if they don't satisfy this, then I don't have a C1 plus alpha result, I just have a biholder result. A biholder coming from Reifenberg, as you might have uh, imagined, okay? But otherwise, the situation can extend a little bit, uh, okay? And I think, so about the proof, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> and okay. And let me just say why it makes sort of sense to stop here. So next time I should try to talk about the boundary again. 
And the typical, I mean, the best result that we would hope to prove at the boundary would be the Gene Taylor result uh, here. We would just say at every point at the boundary, there is a blow up, uh, you know, there is a blow up limit, which is a minimal cone. Try to list all the minimal cones and try to say when you're close to a minimal cone, you are actually a C1 plus alpha version of a minimal cone nearby. That's what we would dream to do. Uh, that's what we'll not do, but uh, this will be tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, thanks.